And we're back again. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and welcome to another show, Facebook Live with Matthew. I am Matthew, I'm your host, coming at you live this evening from beautiful North End, Halifax, Nova Scotia, where we are expecting light snow this evening, a low of minus eight snow, rain in the forecast for tomorrow. I will let you know that the weather currently in Kyiv, Ukraine, it is, it's about plus two with rain. Uh, they are six hours ahead. It is already in the early morning hours of Wednesday, March 2nd. So that's what's happening in Ukraine with the weather. There is obviously so much more happening over there. It's nine o'clock here in the Atlantic provinces. It's eight o'clock Eastern in Washington, D.C., where the U.S. President Joe Biden is getting ready to address the State of the Union. Now, I won't be watching it, obviously, because I'm here doing this. But what I can tell you is this program right here for the next 30 minutes or so, I will do everything in my power to bring a smile to your face and maybe even give you a chuckle because that is exactly what we need right now. So I'm just waiting for my guest to join me this evening. Uh, this has been uh, a lot of fun. It's been a learning curve. Uh, I love doing the research. I love meeting new people and I love sharing their stories. And there is no better place to share stories than right here on Facebook Live with Matthew. So thank you for the live views. If you're watching this at your leisure, I certainly appreciate that as well. I see my guest is here. So the next person you see on the screen will be the lovely Megan St. Rose. So let's bring Megan into the broadcast. So the next person you see will be Megan. Hello. Hello, Megan, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm well, I am um, comfortable. I have four walls around me and everyone that I love is in this house. But I, I was just saying before you came on here, and I hope you're well as well. Uh, this is, there's just so much craziness for a lack of better words that's happening right now in the world. So for those people that are joining the broadcast, your friends, my friends, the entire audience, what I'd really like to do is to try and bring a smile to people's faces tonight, maybe give them a laugh. And we'll do that by uh, letting them know more about Megan St. Rose. Cool. Do you want me to just like introduce myself? Or? Well, uh, what I, I, I know that you are a musician and you're also a, a, a digital media producer. So let's talk about you as a musician first. Now I did my research on you. Now I know that back in the day, uh, you were a part of Halifax's open mic circuit. And back in the day, you were doing uh, acoustic folk ballads. You are now the lead singer of a heavy metal band, Vormir. Can you just kind of walk us through uh, how you go from... I, I just want to know more about you as a musician. So let's just start with that, Megan. <laughs> Cool. Uh, yeah, well, I'll give you kind of like the, the history on that. Um, I started playing guitar when I was like 10. Um, I've always been a writer writing to myself. I was pretty like solo kid for the most part, like very off to myself. Um, and so I spent a lot of time writing and a lot of it was like poetry and creative writing, which is ironic because all of my English class marks would not reflect the amount of writing mm -hmm. that I've done in my life. Um, and so when I was 10, I got my first guitar. Um, and once again, being kind of a loner, I just like played guitar all the time and started working on like trying to like learn to play songs with my guitar. So my first instrument was an acoustic guitar. So what else, what's better to do than just like learn and sit, play and sing. And so when I was about 14, I started learning covers of this uh, super indie artist. Um, by, super indie just means like, like back then when the style was indie, he was like right in line with it, uh, Never Show Never. And so that was like, you know, former emo kids with beanies and like, you know, skinny jeans and all that kind of stuff. So I would just play a lot of his songs. And I started by doing some like, 
YouTube videos and whatnot, which was really out of my out of my comfort zone. Because like I'm the kind of person where when I was younger, I would cry every time I hit the stage. Like if I was on stage, as soon as I was done, if I even managed to get started, I would come off and I would just like cry out of anxiety. So I started doing YouTube videos to like just get used to it. I was like, what if I perform mm -hmm. and I know there's an audience, but I can't see the audience. So I kept doing that. I played my first show in Burlington, Ontario, when I was 15 years old at a battle of the bands that I was not allowed to compete in because I was a student in the next city over and it was only for like school students who were in Burlington. And so um, they allowed me to have an opening spot, but nobody realized that I wasn't eligible for the battle of the bands because also I wasn't a band. And so I got the most votes. I didn't end up getting the prize, so and I like forfeit. I was totally fine with that. So um, I was like, no, I get it. I get the you know specifics. So I, the band, the prize went to like the second, and um, yeah. Ever since then, I just like would just do a lot of like, you know, acoustic stuff on my own. I tried to start bands. I tried to start like a melodic death metal band, and they wanted more like, you know, opera style music to it, and that just like wasn't my style. I kept wanting to do like thrashier stuff, rock stuff. And so I was trying to write rock versions of these like acoustic songs just so I could have them ready by the time I found a band and just like it, you know, never really came to fruition. The first band I actually joined wasn't until I was in a band called Daggers for a little bit. We didn't really actually play any shows. We recorded one of my songs, released a music video uh, called When I Fall. And then I ended up being in a band. I ended up joining a band with White Hills Run about two or three years ago. And so we played like you know, Halifax shows, a lot of Monty's. Um, we played out in uh, Patty's Pub in Wolfville for a little bit. And this was just like three hour sets doing covers. And so over the last, you know, couple of years, it was, you know, I was in a cover band and then I was in like, you know, trying to do my rock music and everything was just like, you know, coming up and then just crash landing and coming up and crash landing. And in the mm. meanwhile, in the meantime, I started making friends with, you know, our, our hip hop artists around here. So like contemporary artists and and a lot of the local rappers and a lot of the like, you know, more contemporary talent that was playing a lot of the like other shows in Halifax. And so I started writing more like R&B kind of stuff. And then I ended up releasing a song. Oh, I don't know why I forget the name of the song, but I ended up releasing a soul song. It's just not coming to me right now. So, um, yeah, and it's it's on, you know, on Spotify under my name, Promised Land. That's what it is. It's Promised Land by me on Spotify. And I really enjoyed doing that. So I started writing a lot more of like soul and R&B stuff and performing there. I ended up managing to play Alderney Landing. And I opened for Classified and then Aaron Carter came to town and I ended up opening for him as well at a bar called Sniggly Wiggly oh, wow. and Snow. So I had, you know, some nice names on my roster of who I opened for. Um, the biggest show actually came last summer where I, so about two or three years ago, I got signed to Soli Productions uh, modeling agency. And I'm not signed as a musician, I'm just like model and acting, but she ended up getting me some nice shows around town. I ended up doing some opening sequences for fashion shows. And last year we had um, a big fashion show right in Parade Square. And I, I don't know exactly how many people, but I would say about a thousand people fill that whole square if like you pack everyone together. So, and that was packed. So about a thousand people came out to see this fashion show. And I opened with um, a song that I recently released a couple months ago called Never Say Never. Did I put on Spotify? I'm pretty sure I put it on Spotify. And it's like <laughs> more of a pop upbeat kind of stuff. And it, it was just like, it was under, the blue moon right in the and it was facing the moon too and like I, I was able to stare up at the sky and see all the crowd and everything it was great and then I ended up walking in the fashion show at the end so that was a really nice like turn of events where I got to both perform and walk in the fashion show uh, however at the beginning of the pandemic um, like shortly not shortly after everything started shutting down but like when it was kind of calming down a bit the first time I see a post on Facebook and uh, the guitarist now guitarist of Vormir Aaron was looking for a female lead vocalist for a project that he had in mind and he was working with oh my god I know if any of them watch it I'm gonna get this wrong but <laughs> he's in a band with our drummer Mitchell another band called Dark Shrine and then so somewhere along the lines by the time I joined it was 
him and Mitchell, and then Corey, our other guitarist. Now, Corey is known in Halifax as, um, you know, well known as the guitarist for a band called Hitman. And that's where our bassist comes in as well. Andrew Coots, also from Hitman. Hitman is, you know, iconic. I love their sound. I love their style. They ended up winning, uh, like, a uh, battle of the bands called the Road to Warp Tour and, like, opened for Monster Truck and everything. So they got some nice, you know, they got a couple of accolades behind them. And now, you know, Warmere took half their band. And now we're Warmere. <laughs> so mm. they're, they still okay. exist. They're still, in, still doing their thing. But we ended up starting this, like, I don't even know how to describe it. All I can describe our like single that we're releasing as is somebody described it as old Black Sabbath, but I feel like it's a little thrashier and more upbeat mm -hmm. than that. Um, but it's super fun. So yeah, that's I've I've done a little bit of everything. I've done the pop music. I've done the soul and R and B kind of stuff. I did the acoustic folk like super indie stuff, and now I am a vocalist for a metal band. And our first single is coming yeah. at the end of March. So uh march 21st is the release of your new single uh why that date because i believe that is the first day of spring did that have anything to do with that release or why did that what what why that date so uh the song is called comic queen and you know i really like concepts and i know that like that song was actually written by aaron so that song already existed by the time i started the band we had there was about five or six songs already written and i kind of like you know maybe tweaked some things here and there and then wrote everything that came after that but comic queen was the first like we're gonna put something out so here's something that we're gonna put out and so we were working on it and just reading the lyrics it kind of I was trying to picture like what it was and kind of the concept of it is like doing some psychedelics, uh, my psychedelic choice is mushrooms. And so getting too out there and like going to space, but like, instead of feeling like you're tripping on hallucinogens, it's you're all of a sudden like a space pirate and you're in, mm -hmm. you know, the concept of comic queen is like, it's a ship called comic queen. And so the idea is like we're, we're, we're revolving around the idea of space like even even like Vormir very planet like very space themed and so we wanted to have uh some sort of like launch code thing I wanted to put like a symbol in the middle launch code in our like Instagram bio um it was gonna be the date but we've adjusted that a couple times and so the launch sequence now is like just binary code for CQ for some comic queen but we were picking a release date and we're like okay well are we going to do it February 22nd, 222? It's like, it's okay, well, you know, we didn't quite finish it yet. So we're getting there and like, you know, let's pick a date that's like reasonable, you know, go a little bit further down. And I was like, what about 321? <laughs> March 21st, 321, blast off. And so that's the idea of the yes. comic queen, blasting off. So since the concept of the comic queen is supposed to be like a spaceship, then, you know, it's, we're launching the spaceship. Perfect. That makes total sense. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Megan, I just want people to know who are, who are tuning in here that all I have done to do my research on you, I just went through your Facebook and I did some other uh, Google searches on you. You're quite uh, prevalent on, on the internet. Uh, yeah. I just quickly <laughs> want to talk about a concert, uh, Stereos, the band Stereos, uh, their 2022 Canadian tour, April 8th, Marquee Ballroom. Uh, okay. Are you going... And I'm just wondering, uh, because by the time that concert rolls around, all the COVID-19 restrictions will be lifted, are, how will you approach going into live concerts? How are you going to approach getting back into public life? So uh, this is a little bit scary for me because I actually, in the midst of the pandemic, got diagnosed with lupus. Um, so I'm like still going through the diagnosis right now. It's It's like like semi-official it's like this is how we're treating it but we still don't know exactly what it is so i do have an autoimmune disorder um i am triple vaxxed <laughs> i have two plus a booster um i am not taking any chances i have a young daughter i this world is dangerous right now i'm gonna do everything i can to make sure that you know my family's safe and so yeah i am i am triple vaxxed and ready for it but uh yes i am going to the stereos concert i have not got my tickets yet but I know that, you know, it's funny, I shared their post and I like entered the contest to try to win tickets and stuff. But they like went and liked my post when I was like, oh my God, high school, like flashback. 
And I noticed all the other shares, they weren't liking everybody's posts. Because I always try to do that. I'm like, do they just like everybody's posts? Or is, or is like my share special? <laughs> and so I don't know if it was just because it was the first share in a while or like it was just, you know, getting uh, the post itself was getting big again. But yeah, they liked my post. So I was like really excited. So I'm definitely going after that. Um, perfect, perfect. And the way I'm going to approach it is, I mean, like crowds are a little bit more scary for me. I always joke around saying that you know, um, since I don't really like being around a lot of people anyways, that's why I chose to be on stage, because I'm not in the crowd. Um, so it's going to be, it's always interesting when I'm going to a show and I'm not on the stage, because I'm not a big drinker or anything. Um, so usually when people go to shows or go to bars, it's like, you know, go drink and go watch a show and whatnot. So for me, it's just like standing there enjoying the music. I'm probably going to try to acquire some sort of like either get there early and get a good seat out of the way or like mm. I don't know who knows maybe if somebody sees this and can get me an opening spot so I can go hang out in the green room <laughs> instead of with the crowd so, yeah, <laughs> that would be super cool even if it's just one song I'll you know just I, I can do it <laughs> but uh yeah I'm just gonna go be my most careful um I'm still gonna be wearing a mask even when masks are mandatory I'm still gonna be super careful and like keep my distance from people because like i like my space anyways um yes yeah, yes okay uh just one final thing as a musician uh you were just talking about how you're not a big fan of crowds you'd rather be on stage but i'm wondering if you just take us back in time if you can share if you have one do you have a favorite mosh pit story have you ever been in a mosh pit <laughs> i do actually okay so good good preface, so this by um i'm gonna i'm gonna be really cute for a second because our I, my favorite mosh pit story also goes into my favorite love story um it's actually the cutest thing ever yeah so uh i recently started seeing my partner a couple months ago um we had like a wonderful four day three night first date it was like in you know we went on vacation for our first date it was great we found out in the midst of talking before this first date that one we've been crushing on each other for the last five years so that was just cool but the big thing that relates to this because i know he's going to be like why is she talking about this or he's going to be really happy about it who knows but um <laughs> the big thing was that 10 years ago um i was at warp tour in toronto and in this at this point i so i grew up in oakville ontario and so i was living in oakville ontario outside of toronto and my partner was living in Moncton, New Brunswick, where he is. And so there's no way that we could have possibly ever crossed paths, known each other, anything before I even moved to Nova Scotia. Because the first time we met was in Halifax when he was living in Halifax and I was living in Halifax five years ago. And so 10 years, he was talking about when he went to Warp Tour when he was 2019 or when he was 19. And I remember, I know that, you know, we're a year apart when he was 19, I was 18. When I was 18, I went to Warp Tour and I know that there wasn't a Montreal stop. And I know he said that he'd been to one place in the States and I don't think it was a Warp Tour situation. So I was like, wait a minute, were you at Warp Tour at this on this year? I was like, he was like, maybe? I was like, was there a big like hurricane almost weather that forced everyone into the amphitheater? He was like, yeah. And so we actually, um, turns out we mapped out the amphitheater of where we were standing and everything turns out we were within like 20 30 feet of each other for like five hours that day so it was wow. yeah 10 years ago like a decade ago but that is not the mosh pit story i just had to share that because it's that warp tour turns out to be like so important in my life um just like every event that happened that day so in the mosh pit um i don't even remember what concert it was like I want to say it was Memphis Mayfire but I don't think so because I was just focused on what was happening I just remember being in a mosh pit and I saw a girl in heels of all things she's like you know totally done up um all like seen colorful hair and like the emo kid vibes and everything but she's wearing heels now I had had an injury to my foot involving an ATV a week before and of course, of all the places that those heels could go, it was right exactly on the injury. And I will never forget that mosh pit because <laughs> that injury got way worse. <laughs> wow. And then apparently two hours after that mosh pit, I was within close vicinity of my now partner. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to quickly share my favorite mosh pit story. And yeah, I'll just definitely. do it quickly. 
uh, Lollapalooza in Barrie, Ontario in the early 90s. Uh, okay. Red Hot Chili Peppers, Soundgarden, Pearl Jam, Ministry. Uh, yeah, those, those were the big names. That's, that's my mosh pit story. And, it, you know, uh, and I'll just, I, I went to this show with uh, three of my friends. Uh, within an hour of being there together, the, the mosh pit, there was just thousands of people in this mosh pit. Two of us separated. We all got separated. And I didn't see my friends for 12 hours. I didn't see my friends until we got back to the vehicle after the concert. Oh my. And I did search for them, but I just, I just never did find them. Mm. Uh, great story. Uh, it's a small world after all. It really is, yeah. Uh, okay, let's move on to the uh, digital media producer. Exactly what is that? And how are you going to be helping new bands book uh, this coming year? So I'm not in booking, I'm in marketing and branding. Um, and okay. most of my stuff lies in content creation. So digital media producer is basically, um, it's, it's a term that I came up with based on a work placement I did for digital media creation. And I, you know, have been taking more of a producer role in film, I've wanted to start, I started doing um, like documentary style film, just like for the purpose of YouTube or like short films a couple of years ago uh, through a grant that I got through the Youth Art Connection. And so I started um, by doing a 10 minute documentary on the presence of arts in our community and like the importance of art in our community. And so it just kind of like spun out from there. Like I just, I, you know, did that documentary and then I started doing my own music videos and then all of a sudden I was asked if I wanted to join this digital media work placement and so I did and then it was turns out it was to like you know become a self-sufficient digital media producer learn some things and that was really cool um and so I, over the course of time I realized that I really like creating things like creating digital content like I love making music videos I love I was like a graphic design prodigy in high school not to toot my own horn I got like awards and stuff for it it's not something I continued it was just I went to an art school it was my you know it was my medium that I excelled at and I was yeah it was I was pretty proud of the work I did I, I'm not that great of a graphic designer now I know how to use the programs and make something look decent but I wouldn't call myself a graphic designer it just really helps with what I do now but I do like creating graphic art but I love video production more and on top of that, in the last two years, I ended up getting a job as a sound recordist. So I'm the sound recordist for a show on East Link called uh, Pate's Atlantic Notes. We're renewed for a second season this year, which is super exciting, um, which is all about, you know, interviewing musicians and just getting their stories and, and getting musicians, um, you know, talents out there and then recording live performance and whatnot. So last year, I ended up taking a course out of Toronto uh, called Rise. And so basically what it is, um is or like it's like enterprising it's by a company called rise called enterprising youth plus and what they do is it's a class for people who want to learn like it's like the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in eight weeks but you don't get a degree out of it it's like you just it's like an adjacent so you just learn the knowledge that you would learn in the two years of schooling and so i really enjoyed doing that and i structured it around a business plan of doing like like video production, like like creating videos for people. And then over time with the video production, I started learning that, you know, video production can make a lot of money, which is good, but what I'm not getting is the clientele. And so what the clientele are missing is access to funding. So what if I, you know, expand this business into helping artists get access to funding? So what if I just include grant writing in that? And I started realizing that like, you know, I've got other skills in this too. I can, I can record sound, I can record videos, I know how to edit videos, I know how to do graphic design. And I'm doing a lot of this because I'm using a lot of this material to support my own career. And like, I'm seeing people struggle in ways that I found so easy. So why am I not sharing this knowledge? So I started mm -hmm. realizing that it was beneficial to others. And I ended up doing a workshop through the Reachability Association, which they, they're the ones who hosted the digital media work placement. Um, and they asked me to do a talk on songwriting. So I did a one hour workshop. It was very like, it was really cool. It filmed on like TV cameras, felt very Ted talk style. It was really exciting. I had um, some participants who were very, very, you know, well-spoken, well-involved. And, you know, I started to realize that like, 
I can create this business with this like over enveloping, um, you know, like teaching people how to make their own content while providing content services, like basically teaching artists how to be self-sufficient in their career. And so I started modeling a business after that. And then I ended up applying for the seed program, the Nova Scotia self-employment program. I got approved. And so my business got funded and now I'm in the middle of structuring a business that has already helped inspire so many musicians, which makes me so excited. Um, I ended up doing some sound recording for Mars VR Labs, which is, uh, you know, it sounds like it could be a VR game place, but it's not. It's a company that creates, uh, that uses virtual reality technology to help people with disability learn how to use assistive devices in order to not hurt themselves. So it's for like mobility issues and whatnot. And that's really in line with the project, a video project I wanted to do uh, using uh, augmented reality to give people who have physical impairments um, access to things like people in wheel who are wheelchair bound, like going for a walk on the beach by like putting their feet in some sand and giving them some AR glasses to like feel like they're at the beach or like taking them for a walk through the park or anything like that. So I got to meet these people. I got to work with, you know, do a bunch of stuff with some festivals with Youth Art Connection. Um, who else have I got to work with? So many like really cool local artists. Um, I ended up doing a parody music video for uh, this used car dealership in Richmond Hill, Ontario, and they had a professional come in and videotape all of the scenes, almost like exact scene for scene of Macklemore's thrift shop. So, but it's called Car Shop. So it's about a car shop. And it's like, it was absolutely hilarious. So I got to produce this music video that was like scene by scene, almost exactly like thrift shop, like Macklemore's thrift shop, but it's about a car shop. And it's so very weird Al feeling. It was one of my like favorite projects okay. to do. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just, I just, ever since I started doing this, everything's been lining up. I've been working with such cool clients. Um, I've been, wor I've been, you know, talking to so many different musicians. I ended up creating some free networking resources for musicians. So I have like a, a private group for artists who want to share their work and get feedback. Uh, I have a boost group for artists who want to get their like, you know, artists helping artists, you know, like, uh, share this or like hey guys I just posted this and then everybody in the group goes and likes and shares and there's already a boost of likes and everything so just everything that I'm doing is able to help people and I think that's what I love about it most um it's confusing to some people because they're like are you so are you a producer yes are you a grant writer yes are you a graphic designer yes are you a record like audio engineer yes like I do it all of it and when I can get to the point where I can hire other people to do the jobs cool but most of my job right now is basically I learned on my own because I don't have the attention span for schooling, but I went out and got the apprenticeships and got the like, you know, workplace experience of learning how to be self-sufficient as a musician, learning how to set up my own backline, learning how to do my own stage plots, learning how to produce my own videos, learning how even shooting a music, whole music video on a $60 GoPro knockoff. And it was one of my best viewed music videos out of all of the ones that I have. Um, and I'm able to take that and teach other people how to be self-sufficient, which is super cool. So, yeah, that's basically what a digital media producer, it's like, it's like a content creator on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, just, you're so busy just as a producer and a musician, uh, just continued success for you. Uh, so there's a few other things I want to touch base, uh, on, and one of those is social media. I'm wondering how important is it for you to step away from social media for your own mental health once in a while? Oh my God. So important. Most of my job is on social media. And then there's also with everything going on in the world these days. And I know that I'm a hot headed person too. And I'm like, I am not afraid to tell somebody when they're not taking the time to think I am not afraid to tell somebody when they need to like, just, you know, take a breather think logically about things, stop resorting straight to conspiracy theories and pointing fingers. So I know that I can indulge in those like so easily. So I just step back once in a while and just like, I'll shut everything off. And like, I, my, one of my ways of getting around it because I do kind of have to access it every day for the purpose of like putting out my own content while also helping share other people's content and supporting other artists doing their own thing, which is like a big part of what I like to include in my social media presence. I actually removed notifications from my apps. So I choose when I want to go in the app. So there's no like, 
like I don't get I think I get like a really quiet sound when I get like an Instagram message but if somebody likes something on Instagram I might get like top of the screen will come down but there's no sound the phone doesn't vibrate phone doesn't go off um, I frequently have my phone on do not disturb so I like you know have special ways of you know there's special things people can do to get around that and contact me but only the people who would need to contact me in an emergency know that um, but yeah I frequently will put my phone down and people don't believe that because they're like you're on social media so much but you know, it's got the scheduled posts and you know not everything shows up at once as soon as people post it if you know what times to post things and you'll know at what time later that day it'll pop up on everybody's news feed and I, I do research that stuff frequently it changes all the time but you know if you can stay up on trends and you can stay up on what's what then it's definitely useful um if I could live a life without social media I would but um unfortunately it's the best thing going for my career right now it's actually it's helping everything I I I love what social media can do in a positive aspect. I despise what it can do in a negative aspect, but I love the fact that it keeps us connected. Um, you know, people can get in contact with some of the stereos liked my post. I got in contact with a band that I never thought I would be able to talk to ever. And yeah, I have so many other stories like that. So I do believe social media is important. I do believe it is especially important to take breaks. Yes, uh, well said. Uh, if you're just scrolling through Facebook, my name is Matthew. This is Facebook Live. I'm having a great conversation with Megan St. Rose. And uh, I'll be honest, Megan, I was really hoping for a, a larger audience. And the reason I say that, uh, you're an amazing person. Uh, but, uh, but I will say that I, I've, al I've been doing on camera here for like five years. And I've always said it's more important, the content of the program because people can watch this whenever they want. But I have a sneaky suspicion that I know the president of the United States is delivering his State of the Union address when I started this show. So I think a lot of people may be tuning into that. And I said at the beginning, this show right here will bring you a smile and bring you laughter. What he's talking about, probably not so much. So thank you for being with me tonight, Megan. It's a uh, it's a distraction from the craziness that's going on in the world. Uh, late last September, you had a chat with iHeartRadio, and you were talking about your Instagram live series, Live from the Bunker. Uh, what was that all about? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a blast from a little bit in the past now. Uh, so I was living um, in this really interesting space out apartment it was it was kind of a nightmare but I had just made the most out of it and so what I did is I took two shelves and cornered put them right in the corner with about a space that was about the size of a door um, you know we had to remove two closet doors off of one of in one of the rooms because the room was so small it could barely fit a bed so in order to access the closet we had to take the doors off so I used those doors against the back of the shelf and basically like I like had uh, thick blankets and everything like I had formatted that whole thing space to be basically a um, very roughly put together isolation booth with the limited with whatever knowledge I had about you know um, noise reduction and so because I didn't have the, the budget at the time for uh, any sort of soundproofing nor did I have the space and like I was leaving that apartment I knew in a couple months anyway so I didn't want to like make any sort of permanent setup and so I had spent so much time that I noticed that people were doing a lot more lives in the beginning of uh, the pandemic. And I was like, you know what? People are bored. People are at home. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to do it. So I started doing it. And I would like, you know, show some local music, talk about goings on, you know, around town and like, you know, talk about different artists and have people on base, much like what you're doing here. Um, and it was fun. Uh, I did end up having to stop it because unfortunately the pandemic did take a toll on my mental health. Um, and there was a lot of like, I had um, some unfortunate, this, when you're sharing your space with people who you haven't known very long, um, it's really hard to... Mm. Who you don't really know that well, it's really hard to be like... To, to trust if they're going to be respectful or not. And so basically I went through a situation with some mm. 
roommates who didn't respect my space. And so I ended up having to stop the live. I ended up having to move. I went through some stuff like that. And yeah, it was just, I wanted to start it again, but then I got all busy with this business stuff. And I really like the production aspect. Okay. I like hosting. I like talking, but I much prefer doing the producing side of things. Okay. You're always evolving uh, as an artist and as a person. Uh, yeah. Just a couple more things, Megan, that I'm going to let you go. Uh, we talked about social media uh, a few moments ago. You have a musical presence on Tidal, Spotify, TikTok, Amazon Music, and is there another one there? SoundCloud. That's one way. That's You're using social media to get your work out there, and I'm curious – before social media, before all of that, how were you getting your, how were you getting exposure back in the day? So mine was all social media. It was so, like right from the beginning of my career. Cause the first thing that I ever did was like, I was a very anxious teenager. So it was really hard for me to get out there. Even like when I did try to start a band and like when I was trying to play with other people, just the idea of like setting up a show um, I did almost have one show with a band that I was in a bit called uh, Cosmic Mojo. And you know, I ended up moving to Nova Scotia around that time. But it was, it was really nice because I, I ended up missing our first show. But I was replaced by, I think it was Carmen North out of Toronto. Uh, she's now the lead singer of a punk band. I don't remember what the punk band is named, but she is a rock star and a half. And she sent me the most beautiful, like send off message as like, you know, uh, just some words, some words to like send off and basically be like, you sound great. You're a little bit of a legacy. Like I, I had, I was running a music festival in high school that I had started in Oakville. So um, I left a little bit, a tiny bit of a legacy, not, I don't want to call it a legacy because I don't want to be like, ego or anything but it was it was a pretty big show and so she actually was like you know you've you've done so much for music out here it's such an honor to be you know taking this place and stuff like that so it was beautiful I was really sad that I missed the show but same thing that was all through Facebook that was all through social media uh where it was advertised um I was 14 I'm only 27 now so when I started my music career it was right in that age of like when social media started and like I said, what really got me mm. out of my shell was YouTube videos. Um, if you're ever looking for a laugh and an awkward teenager playing guitar, there's, I don't know why I had the weirdest names when I was in high school, but it was, uh, there was Your City, My Town, and then Hypocrites. So like Hippo, G-R-I-T-Z. I, I was into making weird words back then. I came up with the username Fibly and okay. Universicorn. I don't know why. <laughs> Um, but those were my uh, YouTube handles when I was a teenager, way back when, tiny little Megan playing in high school. Um, if you ever want like some blast from the past music there, I do not have those account logins anymore. So they exist and they will never be able to come down because I don't know how to take them off the internet, but they're there. Um, and yeah, so yeah, my whole, my entire music career has been based on social media. Okay. Well, lucky because back in the day, back in my day, it was posters on a telephone pole and word of mouth. That's how that's how you got exposure. Uh, we didn't have social media. I'm, I'm 49. So, you know, my friends who were in bands back in the day, it was, you know, it, it was exactly that putting a poster up and word of mouth. Uh, just one final thing. Uh, Megan, and I appreciate you taking the time out of your Tuesday night to hang out with me on Facebook Live. Uh, we all know what's happening in Ukraine. And right now, the the bravest, the, the big leader that's come out of this is the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, lots of pictures uh, going fan. around, his family picture. Yeah. I'm just wondering, <laughs> big fan, can you, can you just, uh, what do you, just give me your own personal thoughts on the UK, Ukraine president. So I am not a fan of war. Um, you know, we, we had a chat previously about, you know, my having military family and everything like that. And so it's, it's a touchy subject uh, for me, just, you know, being scared and not knowing of what's to come and all that. And, and I get really sad when I see other people in shitty situations. So just knowing what's going on in Ukraine and especially like, you know, having 
knowing what has been going on there for the last couple of years, even even more so than has been publicized, just, you know, knowing people in the military and stuff. Um, it's, it's scary, mm. but watching Zelensky go from the leader of a, a sovereign nation, so like, you know, made the job as a leader of a sovereign nation is making sure that their country is peaceful and that they maintain peace for all of their citizens and those around them, especially being like one of the lar the largest European country, I believe. And so just mm -hmm. like seeing him go straight into battle, I am not one of those people that would be like, oh yeah, everybody's a patriot, definitely go fight for your country. Like, you know, you can fight for your country in your own way, whether it's, you know, trying to reduce the amount of propaganda or like whether it is through social media stuff or whether it is through standing up and staring down the kind of a barrel and saying you know like what is the ukraine saying it's like at least you know at least you know put some seeds in your pockets so flowers grow where you die it's like it's this it's i've been mm. seeing it all over the place with that one i don't think it's savage it's savage mm -hmm. so i think what Zelensky's doing is as far as leaders go and we've heard so many stories about leaders, you know, without naming too many names, because there's multiple uh, disappearing and going on vacation um, in times of crisis. And it's not just one. I'm not singling out specifically ours or, you know, the states or anything like this. this is multiple countries where these leaders will stand up and be like, this is how things should be. And then they'll get their big following. And then in times of crisis, they just disappear. So to see Zelensky, you know, strap up protect his family and and get out there um especially when so many people are in ukraine are trying to fight back and so many people in russia as well are opposing this as well then i think that it is an incredibly strong and brave thing for him to do to sacrifice his safety for the sake of his family and his entire country um and i think that Zelensky is a total badass and i really hope that like mm. multiple leaders you know i'm getting all emotional because i'm like man like every country needs a leader like him um, I'm trying to keep up as much as I can with, the, with that stuff. It's really sad to, you know, we do have the privilege to ignore it over here. So I'm trying not to ignore it, but I'm trying not to indulge too much, you know, try to, we can, we can create a more peaceful mm. future by doing what we can, where we are in the present, you know, making sure that our country doesn't get like that. But I'm not one of those people to say like, you know, I'm going to mind my own business over here because I do believe that every single person has the power to change the world in its entirety. Um, but yeah, Zelensky's doing the right thing. Mm. That's as long, at least that's what I'm seeing. So the things that are being shared about him, as far mm. as I know, he is doing what a leader should be doing. Yes. Uh, and I just want to end that by saying before coming on air here tonight, I just was going through social media just to see what the latest was. And I believe that the Ukraine president uh, had a message for Joe Biden before he delivered his State of the Union. And I quote, I'm not iconic. Ukraine is iconic. Right there. That's, that is what a true leader sounds like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, Megan St. Rose, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your Tuesday night, this first day of March, to join me on Facebook Live. Thank you, Megan. Yes, thank you so much. So I'll, I'll let you excuse yourself. Okay, perfect. Megan's gone. Uh, that was tremendous. And I'll say this again. I was honestly hoping for a larger audience this evening. I was unaware that the president of the United States would be making a state of the union address and not just addressing Americans. He is for all intents and purposes, addressing the world this evening. So if you're watching this at your own leisure, I appreciate the views. I certainly do. Uh, and if you like what you see, what you hear, all I ask is that you share because there is more great Facebook Live with Matthew coming up in the very near future. Uh, how near? Well, tomorrow night, Thursday night, Friday night, three guests will be joining this broadcast right here uh, from the comfort of my own home in beautiful North End, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uh, I will tee up who's going to be in here tomorrow night. She is a millennial hippie, dog lover extraordinaire, 
Cindy James, Cindy James on Facebook Live with Matthew tomorrow night, right here at nine o'clock. Enjoy the rest of your night. Enjoy your Wednesday. We'll see you tomorrow night.